it's so wonderful to see such a, an incredible turnout. I hope you're all doing well and staying safe and healthy. My name is Shana Vaser, and I'm part of the advocacy team at UNA NCA. I'm incredibly excited to welcome you to the latest segment of our brand new coffee chat series. Uh, so, just managing all the, all the people trying to join us. So for our new friends, UNA NCA is the largest chapter of UNA USA, which is a grassroots movement of Americans across the country advocating and educating on behalf of a strong partnership with the United Nations. And we use this coffee chat series as an opportunity to bring together experts and activists and thought leaders across a number of industries and hold coffee chats about anything related to the sustainable development goals. Today, we are going to be discussing women in leadership with some incredible women leaders, also touching on SDG5 and the UN's work on gender equality. If you have any questions about how to become a member or how to find a chapter near you, you can contact me directly. I'll put my email in the chat below. Uh, we'll also have a slide at the end with some of that information. Now, for today's conversation, like I mentioned, we have some absolutely incredible coffee chatters, uh, as well as our fearless leader at UNA NCA, Paula Boland, who will be moderating the conversation. Uh, we'll be spending most of the hour with that conversation, but we'll dedicate about 15 minutes at the end to audience Q&A. So we ask and actively encourage you to participate in the chat. In order to access the chat, if you look at your Zoom screen interface, there will be a button towards the bottom uh, that says chat. Just click on that, make sure your message is directed towards everyone and you'll be able to add a comment, ask a question throughout the entire conversation. And in that last 15 minutes, we'll refer back on that uh, and make sure those questions get answered. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Paula Boland, who will be serving as our moderator. So as I mentioned, Paula is the executive director of UNA NCA, as well as a newly reelected regional representative of the UNA USA National Council. Paula is an attorney specialized in environmental law and international affairs. Following her clerkship at the Environmental Enforcement Section of the U.S. Department of Justice, Paula went on to work with a number of NGOs focused on the development of environmental conservation projects across Latin America. She began her journey at UNA NCA as a volunteer and has since been honored with the Evelyn Falkowski Volunteer Service Award and the UNA USA 70th Anniversary Chapter Legacy Award. Paula, to our speakers, we're incredibly excited to have you. Take it away. Thank you so much, Shana, for your wonderful effort in putting this together, a new series for UNA NCA, and welcome you all uh, for our second coffee chat. Uh, today's session will explore what it means to be a woman in leadership in the context of the evolving struggle for gender equality. We will review the priorities and barriers to equity while exploring our guest speakers' respective careers, interests, and goals. It is now my pleasure to introduce our coffee chatters, and I'm going to start with Karen Mulhauser. Karen Mulhauser. Uh, has served in a number of roles in her distinguished uh, career as a women's rights advocate. Karen is past president of UNANCA, our chapter, past chair of the UNA USA National Council, founder and coordinator of Consulting Women, chair emerita um, of Women's Information Network, known as WIN, among many other titles. I could go on and on with Karen, but I, I'm gonna keep it at that. Uh, she's a, trained as a biochemist. Karen is a renowned coalition builder and activist whose recent work has centered on the vitality of voter engagement. To me personally, and from the very beginning of my journey in UNA and CA as a volunteer, Karen has been an incredible mentor, friend, and someone who gave me the space to grow as a leader, who empowered me to empower other women in the field. So thank you, Karen, for being, and continue to be such a role model to me and to many others in UNA and beyond. Rachel Bowen Pittman serves currently as the executive director of UNA USA, our national organization, grassroots movement of more than 20,000 Americans in over 20, 200 chapters across the US who are dedicated to supporting the work of the United Nations in communities, on campuses, and on Capitol Hill. 
Prior to joining UNA USA, Rachel served on multiple leadership teams for several professional associations that represented lawyers, surgeons, regulators, and engineers. But if you ask her, supporting UNA USA staff and members in their efforts to make the future brighter is her greatest, greatest inspiration. And it's been a pleasure for me uh, to work closely with Rachel as a member of the National Council. We have Gayatri Patel with us as well. Uh, Gayatri, if you can wave so folks can see you in the screen. Very good. She's the Director of Gender Advocacy at CARE USA. In this capacity, she leads the advocacy and outreach efforts of the organization on gender priorities that cut across all of CARE's work, both in the US and globally. Gayatri is a co-chair of the Girls Not Brides USA Coalition, as well as the steering group of the Coalition to End Violence Against Women. Gayatri joined CARE after nearly 10 years advising the State Department on a variety of human rights and humanitarian issues. Lastly, we have with us Anna Nelson. Anna, there you are. She is a junior international business major with a concentration in emerging nations and a minor in political science at Howard University in Washington, DC. Currently, Anna serves as the student representative for UNA and CA on our board and as the president of the UNA Howard Chapter Campus. Um, she has interned uh, at New York City Health and Hospitals, the Bureau of Human Resources at the State Department, and the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Ona has been a very active and engaging member of our board, reaching out to students in our community and advocating for a strong US-UN partnership. All right, thank you and welcome to our distinguished chatters this afternoon. Hope everyone has thank you. their favorite beverages on hand. We're gonna start our conversation today um, with an overview on the status of gender equality. And I would like to start with Karen, because as I mentioned earlier, Karen has been uh, very much a part of the movement, the movement that went back to the 70s, the women's movement. And I would like to ask her, how do you see the gender equality agenda evolve from that uh, historic time? And what, what, what are the things that you feel that in the 21st century have been um, kept strong? And uh, what are some of the challenges that we're facing? Thank you so much, Paola, and thank you others who are with us today. Um, well, just to, to say, I, I entered the movement almost by act. I'd rather work with people than with rats um, doing research. And so um, I, I, I became involved when I ended up doing some counseling on on contraceptive technology and before abortion was legal. In, in 73, I started working at the National Abortion Rights Action League. And ever since then, uh, gender equity has been central to my own work and thinking. Um, unless women have the, the right and the opportunities to decide when or if to have children, they really can't opt for any of the other economic and uh, education opportunities that people who don't get pregnant have. So. Um, I, uh, I've seen a lot of progress because for a while abortion was legal and available throughout the country as were other opportunities and there are more women getting higher education. There are more women uh, represented in, in policy making positions in Congress and state legislatures. But in recent years, there's been some backstepping um, on, on all corners and I I will talk later about what this has caused me to do, which is you all may know that this is the centennial of uh, the suffrage, women's suffrage, and, um, and this 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. And so um, my idea of extreme advocacy is to get people out and voting. And so I'm doing that with a group called Every Woman Vote 2020. And I can send information about that to others. Please do. Every, every woman, everyone has to vote. 
<laughs> you don't cease to, to impress me. You're always starting a new initiative. And this one is such a timely and critical one. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. I'd like to uh, now turn to Rachel, um, who represents UNA USA and the UN Foundation, uh, and ask her to share with us some of the highlights um, of the work that the UN and its agencies are doing when it comes to advancing the gender equality. That's a big question. Um, yes, it I, is. <laughs> and I want to answer that in two parts. Um, one externally through uh, the UN agencies and their partnerships, and then the other internally through the reforms that they're doing. So externally um, highlighting two agencies, I think it's really important. Um, one is UN Women, mm -hmm. and they're dedicated to gender equality and the empowerment of women. They focus a lot on the sustainable development goals and making it a reality um, uh, for, for women and girls. Uh, they focus on four strategic areas. One is women to lead, participate in, and benefit from governance systems. Um, the next is to have income security and decent work and economic autonomy. Um, they are also looking to have women and girls live a life free from all forms of violence. And then they work on issues that deal with having a greater influence uh, for women and girls in building sustainable peace and resilience. Um, and especially a benefit when it comes to natural disasters and conflicts um, around um, in, in humanitarian action. So that's UN Women. And then another important agency is the UN, uh, the UN Population Fund or UNFPA. And they focus a lot on reproductive health and rights for all. And then they also focus on um, working to end unmet need for family planning, um, to end preventable maternal deaths, and then to end violence and harmful practice, practices against women and girls. Um, I did go to uh, Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh uh, to see the firsthand the Rohingya crisis. And it was incredible just to see UNFPA in action um, they had maternity clinics and working with women um, and, and their needs on um, having a safe um, pregnancy and delivery. And then there are other agencies within the UN system that also focuses on the needs of women and girls. So for example, UNHCR um, has programs on educating girls to working with women on skills so that they can um, you know, have, have money so that they can survive. So that's kind of the external, I would say, of um, the UN and, and their work through the agencies. And then internally, um, through the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, um, he launched a system-wide strategy on gender parity in 2017. And so in 2019 of last year, um, through all the work that he did, they finally, for the first time in the UN's history, reached parity in the senior management group and among resident coordinators. And then as of this January 1st, they attained another milestone of having parity among full-time senior leaders. Those, that's the ASGs, the USGs, basically they had 90 women and 90 men at that level in the organization. But the one thing I want to point out is that there's not parity in the specialized agencies because the Secretary General doesn't have control over their choice of leadership. So I think it's a big, uh, a huge accomplishment that they're wanting to funnel down um, through the rest of the organization. So now that they have senior management, they're going to try to keep working on um, having parity throughout the organization, which is exciting. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you for bringing us the internal and external dimensions. Uh, Gayatri, let me turn to you now and ask you, as um, Director for Gender Advocacy at CARE, tell us a little bit more about the work that you carry out to advance uh, gender 
um, equity, gender equality. Um, Rachel referred to, to UN and UN agencies, but there are other organizations beyond the UN working in this space. Absolutely. Um, well, for those of you who aren't familiar with CARE, we are a large international development organization that works on international development and humanitarian assistance. And while our bread and butter is really on implementing programs, working around the world, I think we work in about 190 countries, um, or maybe 100 countries. I really need to get that number <laughs> straight. <laughs> um, my, my work focuses on influencing policy. So I work primarily with colleagues on Capitol Hill, within the administration, and with partner organizations like, like many of the ones here, including UN agencies, to really get to the heart of what does it mean to have a gender equitable approach, a gender equitable society? How can we achieve gender justice? And policy and advocacy is so central to that, so central to the idea of multiplying the impact of a lot of the work that we're doing on the field or in the field. Um, and I come from a government background. I worked, as, as you said, Paula, I worked in the government for about 10 years on a variety of issues, including human trafficking, human rights within the UN, um, UN system, um, migration, humanitarian issues. And so it's very much a, a, a perspective of trying to influence people and in, influence minds, but also influence legislation, influence foreign policy, et cetera. Um, so when it comes to gender equality, I think there are so many different ways of looking at it. And we, we tend to look sectorally. We look at, you know, we have the gender-based violence folks. We have the women's economic empowerment folks. We have the folks who are focused on sexual and reproductive health and rights. What we try to do at CARE is look across a number of these sectors and, and look at some of the cross-sectoral approaches. Um, and I think there, there are three foundational issues that I would bring our attention to. One is women's leadership and participation. We absolutely must have women and girls at decision-making tables because there are so many policies and programs that are impacting them, yet they're so often so excluded across levels, whether it's a community level, local council, all the way up to um, you know, government structures where women are not part of those who are making the decision. So we really need to draw them in. Um, secondly, I would, I would really draw our attention to fundamental rights. I mean, the, what, what Karen was saying earlier about you know, the, the right to bodily autonomy and the, the right to control your own body and your own choices, um, the right to live free from violence, those issues are so foundational to progressing economically, pro progressing politically, et cetera, and so, so very foundational. And then third, and I think that there's growing awareness of this and, and growing, um, a growing body of work around this, particularly from previous generations of feminism all the way up until now, but the idea of intersectionality and realizing that it's, you know, it's a variety of voices and a variety of perspectives and backgrounds that need to be part of this discussion. So when, it, when I think of gender equality and gender justice, those are some of the issues that I consider. Excellent. Well, that's a, a very comprehensive um, explanation of all the different dimensions that come to play when it comes to supporting and advancing the gender equality agenda. And, and, and as you all know, while there has been quite a bit of progress uh, in advancing SDG 5, gender equality, from the time we had the Millennium Development Goals, we still have quite a bit of work ahead. There's still a, a strong a number of, of women and girls that are subjected to violence uh, in different forms of violence uh, around, the in, in, around the world. Um, and uh, they are not accessing uh, primary or secondary education. All of the issues that you Gayatri just mentioned in terms of uh, hampering the, the agenda. Um, but there is uh, more and more consensus and realization that if we work together on all of this uh, cross-sectional um, aspects of the gender equality agenda, we will have a more sustainable world and other goals will also benefit from that in the global agenda. And this is the decade for action. Um, we have 10 years starting in 2020 to achieve the 2030 agenda. All right, let me now turn to uh, Ona, uh, our youth ambassador, student representative. From your perspective, Ona, as a student leader, um, 
do you think have been some of the main impacts that youth movements uh, have had in the gender equality agenda? How do you see yourself in that movement? So thank you, Paula. I just want to say I've been really inspired by all the women on this panel. Like I'm over 20 years old and you guys, your career paths and the impact you're making in society is so inspiring. And I think that your inspiration helps the youth lead what they do because they have to look up to somebody and you have so many women leaders, especially who are doing such great things. And youth, they when they're inspired, they take their creativity and they turn it into a movement that kind of fits their generation. So I'm part of Generation Z. I also know that millennials have been really impactful in the movement and, um, and helping spread awareness about the SDGs or about certain issues going on in our society. I always touch on social media because I think that has been just instrumental in sharing the word, informing people, especially people who may not be regularly checking the news or who not who may not be initially interested. And I think that millennials and Generation Z has really utilized their platforms and gained media attention. They've gained following and they're really trying to inform their viewers in the best way possible. I think that with hashtag me too, but instrumental when um women's equality in the workplace and making sure women are heard in terms of sexual assault and harassment, um, that has changed the game just tremendously. I think that women feeling comfortable in the workplace and being heard is really important in women leadership as well. It's Being a leader is already tough as it is, but I think that when you're going into a workplace already expecting or having that fear of being harassed, that could really kind of really dampen the impact that women leaders can make. And I've been super proud to see all these um, w female, but also young leaders doing amazing things like March of Our Lives. When I went, I think it was last year, how that was led by high schoolers. Mm -hmm. Like I, that's, So that's the kind of impact that our generation can make. I think that in every generation, even generation after Gen Z, we're always gonna have those influential leaders and I, who will, use their voice in, in, in an impactful way. And I think social media has been very, very influential to making sure that we have our platform to be heard. Thank you, Anna. Indeed, and we're seeing that in so many different fields, right? Um, in climate, gender, uh, peace and security, uh, many, many gun youth safety. movements. <laughs> exactly, gun safety. Uh, let me now turn the, the lens a little bit more at, at the um, national and local levels and I'm going to ask um, Karen Mulhauser to tell us a little bit about what CETA is. I, I'm not sure everyone participating in today's coffee chat is familiar about CETA and the Cities for CETA initiative. And then I'll also like to, uh, for Shana to unmute uh, London Bell, um, who is a UNA USA National Council from Detroit, who is also the leader of the UNA uh, Women Affinity Group um, for for her to tell us their work, okay? okay. I, I, I will start, and, and I just wanna go on record saying, since I'm twice as old, at least as most of the rest of them, I should have more time, but <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's such an honor to be with all of you and to see so many faces here. Uh, CEDA is a UN uh, treaty. It's, and most people call it CEDA because they can't remember all the words, which is the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. So this was uh, passed by the UN General Assembly in 1979. It was signed by uh, President Carter, but it was never ratified by the US Congress, by the US Senate. And so, and, and it looks like for some time forward, it's not going to be ratified uh, in the Senate. And so uh, what we have is um, a lot of state and local initiatives to, uh, include the principles of CEDAW in their local legislation. And it's very exciting, the Cities for CEDAW initiative. And I, uh, I wanna give a, a shout out to somebody who sent me a, an individual private message, and that's Marcia Brewster. Thank you so much, Marcia, for the coffee chat. Um, he says that the Westchester County Board of Legislators passed a resolution on CEDAW last night. Oh, wow. Wow. Mount Vernon was the first city in New York. Westchester is the first county. And UNA Westchester and its president, Mahuna Edwards, were behind this. 
on to New York City and the state. So, let's bravo. <laughs> And nice. here in D.C., um, there was legislation initially uh, introduced in 1915 in the city council uh, to have the principles of CEDA uh, impacted in D.C., but it never passed, it never had a hearing. And then subsequently, another council member uh, introduced or wrote a letter to the city administrator saying that the 80-plus uh, performance reviews that every D.C. agency is supposed to submit every year should include gender data because there was absolutely no gender data included in the reports. And so we didn't know how many men and how many women, who's getting paid more than others. And so some of the agencies have tried to do that, but we still don't have that data. So, so you and ANCA, we have some work to do here, plus uh, work to do in Maryland and Northern Virginia to implement the principles of CEDAW. Uh, so it's good to see your face, London, and Marsha, good to see you put your face up, <laughs> Marsha Brewster. So, um, Congratulations, Marsha, and Linda, go ahead. Women mm -hmm. uh, London. Yes, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is London Bell, and uh, as Paula um, was saying, I am a uh, UNA USA National Council member representing the Great Lakes states. And I'm also a UNA women, uh, co-chair of UNA women and affinity group of UNA USA. Um, my co-chair uh, is Himaja Najaretti. And our, we have a small committee. Uh, Karen has been on the committee. Um, Rachel is on our committee. Uh, and Tina Halbig, who is our advocacy chair, you know, USA advocacy chair. And so um, we got, we have some great things happening over at UNA Women. Um, this year, particularly, uh, we are continuing to follow the UN agenda uh, on gender equality and developing programs, particularly webinars with subject matter expert speakers, uh, through a Beijing plus 25 and SDG lens, particularly SDG 5. Uh, and most recently, um, really excited, we actually <clears throat> were participating in the global conversation launched by the Secretary General for the UN's 75th anniversary. And we just uh, had a consultation, uh, I believe it was last week, on uh, gender equality. And as you all may know, the Secretary General uh, of the United Nations is asking three questions. What kind of future do we want to create? Are we on track to secure a better world? Uh, what action is needed to help us achieve a brighter future? And so we uh, had that conversation through a gender equality lens. Uh, and we had people from all over the country join us and we gathered some great information. We actually uh, hosted that um, webinar session with uh, Mark Goldberg of UN Dispatch. So um, those are some of the exciting things uh, that we're doing um, at UNA Women. And uh, we'll have upcoming programs as well. Paula, did you want me to talk about what I'm doing locally? Sure. So, lo yeah. <laughs> so locally um, here in the Detroit area, I am, one of the things I'm very passionate about is raising awareness and building support for the United Nations on a local level, um, uh, educating local Detroiters on the principles and work and different UN agencies, particularly young people, uh, young women, and training them on national, uh, local, national, and international mecha mechanism, mechanisms of advocacy so that they could implement that in their grassroots activism. So that's what I'm doing uh, on a local you level. You have your own institute too that you launched yes, on social justice. Congratulations on that. Thank you. The name of it is Bell Global Justice Institute. Mm -hmm. And we are an organization working to uh, advance and promote international human rights for women and girls. And I actually named the organization after my brother, Staff Sergeant Vincent J. Bell. Uh, who uh, was a Marine and killed in action in Afghanistan. And so he has a legacy of service and leadership. And so we're continuing his legacy. You're honoring that legacy. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. We're now Paula, going to I, trans... I, Paula, sure. could, if I could just add, because I forgot to mention that the UNANCA chapter submitted two UPR, Universal Periodic Review Reports, in October. And uh, one of them, uh, we yeah. worked at the UDC Law School Clinic uh, on legislation. 
And that was all about gender equity within BC. And so uh, we can share that with the group if they're interested. The other one uh, was done with the uh, George Washington University School of Law. And that one was the featured piece was about BC statehood and how we don't, you know, it's a human right in this country that it is a democracy to have voting representation and we don't have That's it. That's right. That Very along with homelessness and a few other items too. But thank you so much for reminding that uh, of that because we will share with everyone uh, as a follow-up the links to the two reports uh, that we submitted um, and ours were two of many other reports that uh, other UNA um, USA chapters did um, so stay tuned on that we're now going to transition to uh, the careers portion of this conversation so I'd like to ask all of our uh, chatters uh, guest speakers what does it mean to be a woman, uh, a woman in leadership? What special event inspired you to become a leader, a mentor? So, who would like to start first? I'll go first. <laughs> go first. Um, so, what does it mean to be a woman in leadership? I, I think it has to do with our decision-making process, um, where, you know, a lot of women, look to collaboration, using empathy and patience in making our decisions. Um, and then I'm going to do rapid fire. And then um, what inspired me to become a leader? I think two, two things. As a kid, um, I always loved the movies with really strong female leaders that were taken seriously. Um, I like the movie Nine to Five from the 80s. <laughs> you remember that if anyone. So that always inspired me, you know, things like that as a kid to want to um, be a leader. Um, and then as a young adult, I think um, having really great female bosses, um, they seem to be the ones to show a lot of interest in me and my success. And they had a, uh, a lot of high expectations of me. So, um, you know, I think that kind of molded me into wanting to do well and to lead because I had them as mentors. Wonderful. Who'd like to follow Rachel? Well, it's hard to follow Rachel, but I'll try. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I had a woman leader in my family. My mother, uh, who was born in 1905, so before women had the right to vote, became a, a, a PhD botanist and taught at the University of Texas before there were black students allowed in, at the university. So she was a leader trying to get black students admitted. And, and uh, when she got married at 35, she had five children. And then when the youngest went to work, went to school, she went back to work. So I had that inspiration but nonetheless, none of my college classmates would ever have thought that I would become a leader because the reason I was a biologist is that I was shy and hiding out in the science building all the time. So it was <laughs> a surprise to me and to anyone who knew me back then that I could become a leader. And, um, and so I, uh, I, I think it was, uh, and in, in my growing up formative teenage and 20s years, there weren't as many women leaders as, as Rachel was able to experience in her formative growing up years. But um, when I saw injustices and I found people who worked against injustice, that inspired me, whether they were men or women. And um, three years ago, I was invited to speak uh, by a UNA member up in New York to speak at a conference of young black women professionals um, about self-care. And I said, what in the world would a white lady have to say to young black women that would be relevant? And she said, well, um, you've been taking care of yourself. So just talk about that. And not knowing how to talk about that, what I did was, was write a letter to my teenage self uh, that started out, you're not always gonna be so shy. But the message that I gave throughout that document, which if you're interested, I can, I can share with, with Paola. 
um, is that, first of all, you need to know what you're passionate about. I learned that I was more passionate about gender justice than about biochemistry. And if you're, even if you're well along a path that's not your passion, get off that path and find another. And then another lesson that I gave to the young black women was um, take some risks. So I thought I was a total failure when I dropped out of graduate school, but I, I took that risk to find another path. And then the other lesson that was important to me, but not to everyone, I said to 15 year old Karen, you are going to learn that you do your best work when you do it with others and that doing with others in community is more productive than working alone. So, Beautiful. so that's, that's Karen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gayatri, can we go with you next? Yes, of course. Um, well, I, I would agree with everything that Rachel and Karen said, particularly around you know, understanding your passion, understanding um, how important it is to, to be part of the decision-making structure. And for me, leadership and women's leadership in particular is about that, the, having a voice, but just understanding that you have a right to be there. You have a, a right to have a voice. You have a right to, to state your opinions. These, impact, the, these policies, these procedures, whatever they are, impact you, and you have a right to speak up. And I think that when I overcame my own shyness as a high schooler and, and college kid and law student, that really hit home to me that I am smart. I know what I'm talking about. I may not know everything, but I, I can speak up and I shouldn't feel shy about it. So I, I think that was important to me and important for me to see modeled in others. Um, like Rachel, I had a number of bosses, men and women, who really encouraged me to speak up and to, sh to share my thoughts. Um, and really challenged me. And I, I think that having that experience, having those people around to challenge me is something that I want to do paying forward and, and making sure that I'm bringing in other voices to the table, that I'm, I'm looking at who, who's being quiet in the room and why are they being quiet? Is it because they're shy? Is it because the, the, that format is not the best place for them to speak up? But really, really making sure that voices are heard. Um, so I, I think that's a really central piece of women, women in leadership and women's leadership. And then in terms of the, the events that, you know, inspired or instigated women, um, my own leadership, I don't, I can't point to one in particular. I think it was a series of, of events. I think it's, you know, every time I see a powerful woman speaking up, that inspires me. Every time I see someone pushing back against um, injustice or, um, or, or being sidelined, that inspires me. Um, every time I see women collaborating, that's a huge source of inspiration for me. And that's something that I try to bring to some of the coalitions that I work with, that, you know, collective, collective voice and collective advocacy is so critical um, and, and collaboration is so important to that. So I, I think that there are so many different aspects to women's leadership, but having a voice and understanding that you have the right to be there are, are really important to that. Absolutely. Ona. So I agree with basically what all the women said on, on this panel. I think that feeling it and knowing that you have a right to be there and overcoming their shyness, that's something I struggled with when mid middle school, high school, I was really shy. And so leadership really intimidated me. But also like Rachel, I was really inspired by women on TV and TV shows. I'm obsessed with scandal and how to get away with murder. And seeing those <laughs> powerful women just really wanted me to move to Washington, D.C. and really have an impact where I can. I heard this um, a while ago. I don't have the exact quote, but someone, I, I think I read something online where women tend to step into leadership where they feel that they can make a difference or feel needed. And I see that a lot. I think with me, even in my high school, I just always, towards the end, felt stepped up to leadership roles where like no one else either would do anything or they didn't have, they were doing it right or they just kind of left it. And I felt like I can make a difference. And I think that women tend to really fulfill or not even be geared toward, but where they can feel that they, they can make a difference, where they feel that they can have the most impact. And they're really connected to what that role means. And they're not just doing it for fame or just to feel powerful, but where they can really make a difference. And I loved 
what I love, I know some of my favorite female leadership mentors like Shirley Chisholm, they really defied all the odds. They didn't care what men thought, especially in times where women's leadership was really taboo. They really, that passion and that where they felt like they can make a difference is what led them to kind of shed their fear and really be that strong leader that could help change organizations and help other women have their voices be heard. And, and so for me, that's what I, I guess naturally, I just tend to go towards leadership positions where I feel like I can make a difference. And the fact that I think I can make a difference really sheds all my fear and nervousness. Is even if I'm not the perfect leader, if I changed somebody's life or I made at least one small impact, that means I've succeeded. Oh, we need so much of that. What makes a difference also brings the passion, right? And as your moderator, I would just share briefly um, the first and foremost, and because she's here listening to us, um, my mom, my mom has been uh, from day one, uh, my role model um, throughout my upbring upbringing and as a young woman, um, her passion, her determination, her hard work, uh, when, you know, at the time, not many women were, you know, pursuing higher degrees and also taking care of kids and other challenges that came in the way. So mom, thank you so much. You have been an inspiration for me every day. And then it's, it's you and A, to be honest. And I, kind of what I want to share with you is that I, I went to law school. I practiced law for three years. I learned a lot. But I could tell that was not fulfilling, um, at least in the private sector. Um, I, I couldn't feel that I was making a difference. And so I wanted to grow, but I wanted to grow in a way that I was having an impact with my effort. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really until I joined UNA when I was here in the US uh, for a master's degree that um, I, I found the passion for, for international affairs and for working on programs that um, made an impact in the community. So be open because you don't know, there's no specific linear path in your careers. Um, um, I, I don't regret having a law degree because that background has served me well, even when I'm not practicing law. But I was able to embrace when other opportunities, completely different, 180 degree shift in my career came my way and I found my passion. And despite challenges that I might face, this is what I love doing. And um, so that's what I want to share with you. All right. Can, can each one of you summarize some of the main challenges that um, you encounter as you grew um, as leaders or in your current leadership roles? What are some of the, and you can be very frank and open, what are some of the main challenges and how do you go about overcoming those? Whoever would like I can to start, start with one. Sure. I can start with one that, that I've thought about a lot, and that's really about balancing family and career. And I can imagine that there are some on this call who might be able to relate, but, you know, investing so much of your time in your early years into your career, into your education, into building experiences and, and being on a trajectory, but then bringing in the, the pressures of having a family, um, having a life outside of work, et cetera, and, and really trying to balance what that means. And for, for me, it's, it's never a perfect, never a perfect balance, no, no or even close to a perfect balance. Um, my kids are watching cartoons right now so that they don't hop in on this phone call unexpectedly. Um, but it's, it's really just about, for me, understanding what my boundaries were, understanding what my priorities were, and being patient. Um, with myself, but that's, that's, that's only what I can do. I can't influence, you know, what my boss thinks or what my coworkers think or um, whether that means I'm not going to get the promotion that I, that I was aiming for because I had to make different choices. So I would say that that's, that's been one challenge for me in terms of leadership. Excellent. And, and kind of to add on to that, and you were asking for frank and honest, and I think mm -hmm. my answer, a lot of women can relate to, I think the challenge is myself, telling myself that I do belong, telling myself that I, I've earned the right to lead, telling myself that I can take risk, um, and just trying to overcome those negative thoughts in your mind. I think 
I and other women is something that always needs to be worked on, but also to create that um, circle of um, supporters um, who are, you know, helping you along the way and, and cheering you along. I think it's really important. Absolutely. Well, we want to make sure that we have time for um, questions with the, with the audience. So do you have any more comments on challenges, the burning comments that you want to, you want to share from those who haven't spoken? Just ditto to what's been said. <laughs> Great. Great. I want to chime in. Since I'm the youngest, I think that age and experience for me has been a challenge. I'm newer to leadership. I've just basically started, not like, but since my college career so I haven't had the most experience or time so learning how to trust myself and trust my gut has been like a huge um, obstacle for me and what is key is that you're exposing yourself you're out there here with UNANCA at the national level in your chapter campus um, that's I, I think an important um, recommendation for other young leaders out there or potential new leaders out there expose yourself you know um, so, uh, Shayna, do you think we should, I mean, I have more questions when it comes to advocacy. I was hoping to, to ask uh, all of you um, for very brief responses. Um, what does it mean to you to advocate for gender equality and how do you think we should be keeping this um, um, momentum movement going? Um, but I need brief answers so we can then open up for questions. I just want to point out, because she says, what does it mean? It means a lot, <laughs> meaning that mm. the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report this, in, this year came out saying that with all things being equal with current trends, the overall gender gap cannot be closed for another 100 years. Mm. So that's a really long time. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's so important to keep the momentum up on advocating for gender equality and make sure that we don't move backwards. Um, so that's my answer. Absolutely. Got I'll add on to that. Totally agree with, with the last point in particular about not going backwards. We have to build forward on progress and, and we have made tremendous progress in a generation, two generations. Um, but I think we also need to recognize nuances and recognize when when the the progression forward means having those difficult conversations with those who who don't agree with you, um, becoming to common ground and continuing to move forward. I think that's incredibly important. I'd, I'd also like to just add to and my three colleagues as, as panelists here. I'm sure it hasn't. Uh, been ignored by them that the progress has not been as equal. I mean, white women have more access to leadership than women of color. And that goes way back to the suffrage movement when women of color were not as involved in the suffrage because the white women were afraid that, that the Southern states wouldn't ratify. And so we still have not only a lot of work to do with regard to advancement of women, but advancement of people of color as well. And real, well said. Quick, oh, real quick, I'll just add on to make sure you're educating yourself and educating your friends, especially as young as me in college, we have more access to classes, um, libraries, etc. So really read and look up the news, current trends, and make sure you're sharing this information with your peers. Great. All right, Shana. I think it's time to, to look at the chat section. Absolutely. Thank you to everyone who's already been participating, sending me questions personally or in the chat. I'm going to take advantage of my power <laughs> as coordinator <laughs> uh, and ask the first question because I've been reading Trick Mirror by uh, Gia Tolentino. I highly recommend this. Uh, and she writes about something that has really been weighing on my mind, which is this idea that women have been conditioned to always be optimizing not just in terms of our appearance, but we have to consistently become more efficient and more streamlined and grow exponentially. Uh, and there's a number of factors that contribute to this, which has then led me to reflect on my own inability to process failure and rejection. And so I was hoping I could ask to each of you, how do you reconcile with when you fail, what do you consider to be a failure uh, or when you're rejected and, and how do you 
maybe use that to, to take your next steps? How has it informed your decision making? So I would briefly say that you have to figure out the lesson in that rejection in order to uh, advance and move on. I've had some jobs that, you know, I totally hate it, but I feel like there was a reason why I went through that job and I figured out what it was, learned from it, and then was able to use it in my next, um, you know, job. So that's the one thing I would, I would say to that. I, I would just, add to, again, say the same thing that Rachel has just said, that, that um, I've had some failures and I've learned from each of them. I've learned something about myself and I've learned something about organizations that I can apply to the next task in my life and, and I'm a better person for it. So um, if anyone is feeling failure, come and talk to me. I'll tell you how you can benefit from it. <laughs> it might not even be failures. I think it's part of the journey of discovering who we right. are and what we want right. and learn from that. Mm -hmm. I'd agree with all of that and just say, be patient with yourself. Did you try your best? Did you put your very best foot forward? You're not always going to get everything. There might be someone who's more qualified, someone who's more, you know, better positioned. Um, so be patient and, and do your best. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a life lesson for everyone, I think. I, I tell my kids that too. And I would, um, my parents. I would mm -hmm. like to add to that by saying, um, for me, and, um, and when I internalize um, the doors of opportunity that has been closed to me, I think of all the time, um, what other windows of opportunity can you look at? Because I think sometimes we look at the bigger picture and we don't see those small openings that can keep propelling us forward and just keep us motivated. So for me, every time a door has closed, I look for a window, look for those small other things around me that can, that can help me to continue to grow. Um, and uh, I think Karen, like Karen said, um, just thinking about like, what are the other things that, um, that you can use to grow? What are the other things that you do not have in your toolbox that you need to add to mm -hmm. your toolbox? And then not looking at the door that's closed, but thinking about the things that you need in order to develop to get to that next level. Um, and I met um, some young college students, and I always tell them, what other doors up? What what doors can you create for yourself? Not thinking about doors that are closing for you, but what can you create for yourself? Because as as a young woman coming out of college um, and not being able to obtain a job right away, immediately I start thinking about other business opportunities that I could create for myself, not what other people can create for me, but using my gifts, my talents, my education, what can I do for myself? What can I invent? What can I create? Um, and so I'm not necessarily only creating for me, but me creating for myself is also me opening up doors of opportunities for other women. Right. Women helping other women, empowering each other. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, our next question comes from Cindy Roberts, uh, who asked how you deal with this idea of the bully in the boardroom, uh, which I think speaks to this broader trend of, you know, on one hand, women leaders might not be taken seriously, but on the other hand, there's a lot of uh, overt extra scrutiny regarding assertiveness and what have you. You call it out. <laughs> I mean, it's, I've done it a couple times where I felt like I was being man mansplained. What is it called? Is that right? <laughs> you were channeling a man. <laughs> you called it out and said, well, I, I just said that. <laughs> you know, so that's just one thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, if anyone doesn't have anything else to add, uh, Rowan asks, how do we work to make sure when advocating for women's issues, specifically for women issues in different cultures or countries, that we don't fall into the victim story or stereotypes of the community when we're advocating? We at CARE have to deal with that quite often. And it's, it's very much about the language that we use and the, the approaches that we're putting forward. So 
we we never use the word victim. We always use the word survivor. We never use the word um, you know beneficiary. We use the word participant in our programs. It's it's all about promoting the agency and the power of the women who are part of our programs and part of our work to speak for themselves, to be seen as change agents in, in their own, um, but also to recognize the social norms around them that do put them on unequal footing and realizing that it's it's not just a women's problem that the women have to fix. It's a community problem that engaging men and boys, um, looking at the, the power structures and the power differentials, all of those factors are important. So I think it's it, it's not just how you frame it through language, but also how you um, how you design an approach around it, and and you know centering your approach on women as change agents and as powerful in and of themselves is very much a, a center point for us. Thank you, Gayatri. Uh, Victoria James asked, uh, it appears as though this moment uh, in time with the pandemic has galvanized people around the US to revisit the power of the collective and community. Investment in public health, specifically mental health, is desperately needed. How might we, how might we organize and mobilize now to ensure that that happens? I'm just, no, I'm just thinking of like, um, in, in mobilizing, um, I think it's informing and educating people about the issues at hand, especially with mental health, and then providing them with tools and resources to take action on it. Uh, I think that's what UNA USA does a really good job in regards to um, informing its members about, for example, the importance of WHO and why they matter, and then provide um, tools for them to advocate for U.S. funding. So I kind of see it the same way when it comes to issues such as um, mental health, just, you know, making sure people are educated and can make informed decisions and take informed actions. I, I'd like to, to add to that that it is totally valuable, but only the first step to educate people because then, and, and what you, you and USA does well, is uh, inform us of how we can be advocates um, and, and encourage others to be advocates. And that's very important. But what I have learned through my career is that it's not even enough to be advocates. It's what I call extreme advocacy, that mm -hmm. it's not voting for the policymakers that, that will pass the policies that we support, then we're, we've only done half of the work. We, and that's why I've started this initiative. I, I call it a nonpartisan campaign because it's done with 501c3 organizations just to get the leaders, who I call the trusted sources of organizations, to reach out to their members and contacts and say, uh, we, we will not be able to get the policy we support unless we are uh, electing the people who, or, or just to get out the vote. You don't even need to reference the policies, but to get out the vote um, so that there will be better policymakers. So. It's, I call it extreme advocacy. <laughs> I, if I could add to that, um, when we think about um, the collective and the community, I know that the census is something that's very important and that's what's going on right now. Um, I, as an educator in the system, I've been in contact with uh, those people who are um, a part of the census committees in different communities. Um, because I also um, have been one of those people who have been trying to mobilize the, um, the hard to count community to get counted. And I think that's one of the things also that we can start with is how do we um, become a voice in our community and help those who are in the hard to count categories get out there and be counted knowing and, and informing them and educating them about the importance of these um, of this process in providing resources for their community because um, they may not know how important it is and they may not know that the, um, this, these federal dollars that are being plugged into communities help to really um, invest into public health, into mental health, into education and those different facets in the community. So um, I think that those are some of the smaller 
ways that we can do that to make sure that everyone is participating and we are not just out there on the front line advocating for everyone else and showing them small ways that they can advocate for themselves. Mm -hmm. I would add that education and extreme advocacy needs to start as early as possible uh, with children in schools, uh, mm -hmm. at home. Um, so um, we, we, we do some of that in our work uh, with schools and as parents, uh, but that's critically important. To, to help them uh, develop that mindset. Um, I think the gender equality culture is one that, like any other culture, uh, it, it, it takes time to fully set in all the different um, spaces, sectors, environments, uh, but, but it's possible, but it, it takes a collective effort and, and a lot of education and advocacy. I just want to quickly chime in and add that I know social media has been huge in gathering opinions and really galvanizing and making sure that opinions and voices are heard. I think now more than ever, it's super easy to tweet your senator about an issue going on in your community and having that tweet go viral with likes and sharing with your friends. And a lot of senators and House representatives are now taking an active approach to social media and really using that to hear different perspectives of people who may not have the opportunity to go to DC on Capitol Hill and lobby, or maybe they're too afraid to pick up a phone and have a conversation with the staff aide. But I think that using the power of your phone can really help get your voice out there. And if you're sharing it with other people, you're also in, um, informing and um, helping other people have the courage to advocate for themselves as well. All right, how are we doing on time? We are past two, so thank you everyone for your questions. I think Paula, if you have one final question that you'd like to extend to our group, we'll, we'll start to wrap up. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, I, I like to go around and give you less than a minute uh, to summarize some of the key takeaways of recommendations uh, from today's discussion. I'll start with, um a deep commitment to the idea of mentoring that was mentioned earlier. And uh, more than 30 years ago, this group that Paula mentioned, Women's Information Network, started around my dining room table. It's, it has engaged thousands of young pro-choice democratic women uh, in mentoring relationships and in, in kind of support network that, that young women, to, to make this town more welcoming to young women. Gayatri? Yeah, I, I would just leave with the takeaway that um, speak up, take risks, don't, don't be shy or afraid to have those difficult conversations when you disagree about something, but fully believe and understand that you have the right to be there, the right to speak up. Rachel? Uh, find opportunities to advocate for gender equality and get involved wherever you can. I don't know. I would say educate yourself. I would say educate your friends, use your voice, and don't be afraid to stand up for what you believe in. You have some of everything that I would say as well. So I'm just going to emphasize, get involved, get involved, get involved. Um, everyone can make a difference and empowering each other is, is definitely the, the way to move this gender equality agenda forward in all the different spaces that we have here at home and abroad. So with that, I'm gonna have uh, Sheena now remind you, you can do that right now. Join your grassroots movement. Join UNA USA and your favorite chapter if you live in this jurisdiction, UNA and CA. Um, you can do it on our website. You can also do it by texting that number. And really thank you. Thank you to all of our coffee chatters for taking their time to join us today and share their journeys and recommendations uh, for a better world. Thank you to all the many UNA and CA leaders that I'm seeing there. I can't name them all without 
missing some, <laughs> but many of our board members out there, uh, program leaders, staff, um, and also representatives from other UNA USA chapters in the National Council. Thank you so much. Um, we will have yes. the next coffee chat on Thank May 19th. Excuse me? Hello? Not sure can what you hear me? There. Yeah, Paolo, we can hear you. Uh, okay. Can we hear you? Yeah. Well, I, I can see just the four of you now. Um, it's okay. If everyone else is out there, next coffee chat, May 19th. Stay tuned for more details. And ladies, thank you. Everyone is there. Now I can see you. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, Stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. And, thank you, and, Nina. Uh, with regard to gender equality, thank you, men, for joining us. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. We have terrific leaders who empower us. <laughs> yes. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you for moderating. You're welcome. Thank you for organizing. All right. Everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank, thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.